So let's talk about jobs for the different kinds of minds. My kind of mind, skilled traits, art, uh, animals. Now, the thing that worries me about art is AI. Hands-on jobs will not be taken over by AI. All kinds of skilled trade stuff, design work, working with animals. Uh, now, the mathematical minds, uh, computers. Well, there's going to be some computer programming stuff that's going to get taken over. Video game design, forget it. AI is going to eat that one alive. But the, uh, the skilled trade stuff, it's totally safe from AI. Why knowledge matters. Welcome, I'm your host, Yannick, and now joining me, Professor Campbell Grandin. Professor Campbell Grandin is a distinguished professor of animal sciences at Colorado State University. She holds various honorary doctorates, successful author of more than 12 books. Also, her life has been film and made a movie and won Grammy Awards on HBO. She's named one of Times Magazine's 100 most influential people in the world. Induction into the Academy of Arts and Sciences. Inducted in the National Women's Hall of Fame. Champion of Livestock Handling Systems and animal welfare and entrepreneur. Welcome, Professor Campbell Granim, to be on the show. It's such a honor to have you here. You have influenced, I guess, more than anyone else. The changes that you were able to bring for livestock, but also for people with autism is tremendous. So welcome to the show, Temple Granny. It's such a honor. It's great to be here. Let's start. Who is Temple Grandin in one sentence? Well, I like to do find practical solutions to improve uh, conditions, both for animals and for, for um, autistic people. Just practical information that educators, parents can go out and use practical stuff that ranchers can go out and use, and not very much theory. But I base my practical uh, suggestions on theories. But you want to get stuff done in the field, it's got to be practical. When you can just use one word to define Temple Grandin and one picture, what will it be? I don't know. I don't think that way. What's your day routine in general? When do you get up and how does it look like an well, ordinary things day? Changed. Things have changed over the years. So when I first started and when I was in my 20s, my work was all on equipment. I thought if I could have the perfect equipment, it would almost self-manage itself. A lot of engineers make that mistake. I made that mistake. And then I realized that equipment's only half the equation. You have to operate the equipment right so the next middle part of my career i worked on writing animal welfare guidelines for slaughter plants and then i worked on implementing them back in 1999 i had burger king wendy's and mcdonald's and mcdonald's was a pioneer inspecting plants using a very simple scoring system i devised very very simple uh, five of the most important things to measure and when you have a big company enforcing that I saw more improvement than I'd seen in my whole career prior to that. I had a lot of equipment out in the field that people tore up and wrecked, but now they were forced to manage it. You know, I'm way past retirement age. So the main thing I'm doing right now is doing talks to students on autism and animal welfare, both. A lot of speaking engagements, lots of Zoom calls. I had to learn how to do that during COVID. So kind of my career went from equipment designer to animal welfare implementer out in the field. Now I want to help tomorrow's leaders to, to get started. And what's also very interesting, ultimately, and that's very usual in outstanding people, you also become ultimately a public intellectual, really, throughout the whole world. But now let's touch a little bit more on your biography. In hindsight, was your autism or 
neurodiversity a blessing considering your outstanding life? Well, I'm an extreme visual thinker. You see, I don't think verbally. I think in pictures. Everything I think about is a picture. Verbal thinkers are very top down. My thinking is bottom up. So let's take uh, uh, interventions that can help uh, uh, autistic students in schools. Well, there's some very, very simple things. After going to tons of meetings, talking to lots of people, it's very important for them since there's working memory issues and I have them. Any task that involves a sequence, give them a pilot's checklist step by step. Make sure the LED lights don't flicker by checking in with slow motion video. That's another thing, getting bullying under control. Uh, I was called all kinds of names in high school. So those are three very specific things you could do to help that autistic student in the classroom. But they're specific, but they're based on the same things in food safety, we call them critical control points. Um, I, I cannot remember long strings of verbal information. I need to write it down. I need an external working memory. Your mother also was very important because she did not treat you as a, a victim or something that needs to be helped. So how important was your mother to your success? took me to a neurologist who recommended uh, two speech therapy teachers that worked out of a small house. So I got very good early education. She had a very good sense of how much to kind of push me. She also taught me to read when I was age eight. I could not read by age eight. I was fully verbal by four. And uh, she just taught me to read out loud phonics. And we read a book like The Wizard of Oz, a book that would be fun to read. That's our generation's Harry Potter. And she just taught me to sound out my words because sight words didn't work for me. I had great elementary school teachers in a small school. I was a bad high school student. I wasn't interested until my science teacher got me interested in studying so I could become a scientist. So I want to really credit my mother and some very good mentors and teachers that I had. Now, a little bit um, an obvious question. Where did you learn to dress so classy and uniquely? I love your style. Well, it kind of came gradually. I always liked Western. And then um, I just started kind of wearing these shirts. And I go, well, I'm just going to wear them all the time then. And I have like, this is my dress version right now. It's very cold below zero here right now. And I've got electric heat. It's not worked very well. I've got three shirts on under this because I'm right by a cold sliding glass door right now that's covered up with a curtain. Um, so there's three shirts under this. Um, the electric heating in my house has not worked very well. And so you are also your trajectory of your life, and especially also due to also your mother, of course, your family, is, you know, in three words, I would say exploration and exposure, which really ultimately turned into the curiosity and really forged the the innate ability that you had, but somehow was disregarded in school. Would you agree with this uh, assessment? I don't know. You see, I think you're a very verbal person. You see, everything I think about is a picture. And one of the things that helped me in my work with cattle when I first started is I looked at what cattle were seeing, going to a shoot, maybe to be vaccinated or even at the meat plant, and um, they'd stop at a shadow. They'd stop at a reflection. They'd stop at a piece of chain hanging down, a shirt hung on a fence, little things we tend to not notice. You see, in being an extreme visual thinker, in fact, I talk about visual thinking in my book, um, Visual Thinking, Hidden Gifts of People Who Think in Pictures, Patterns, and Abstractions. Now, one of the problems with visual thinkers, you cannot do abstract math. I have to have a picture graphics file in order to remember something. Now, the interesting thing is, in all my equipment work, and I have a lot of equipment still out in the industry, even though a lot of it I developed 30 years ago, it's still out there in the industry. Uh, some of the people who invented some stuff for me and built it were probably autistic. Brilliant metal workers that just could invent machines. And this is something I'm very concerned right now is these people are retiring out. Uh, I just hope our power plant doesn't fail. My house would freeze solid. And the visual thinkers 
are the um, kind of people who are going to keep the lights on, keep the waterworks going, and they're retiring out. So that's another big thing I've been really talking about. And I've talked to a lot of different industries. And that kind of autistic, uh, weird guy in the shop that they really need is retiring out and not getting replaced. So that's a huge problem. And we will actually dive into this a little bit later. Now, just a personal question. You grew up in a Christian home. So did you go regularly, for example, to church? And how did it influence you? And how is it today? Well, yes, I did grow up. And the things that influenced me in church were practical things. And our, one of the things we did in our church, this was in the 50s, is each child had to give a Christmas present for a poor child. And they put all the presents in a big manger up by the altar and said, it's better to give than to receive. That made an impression on me. Concrete, real things. Your life is really a testimony of incredible faith. So how were you able to hold on despite the bullying that you faced, you know, in the school? So what is it particular about you? Is it something innate or something that you got somehow nurtured that you turned from a adversity really into a uh, opportunity because well, it forged this outstanding person that we know know throughout the world well i had my high school science teacher and we had interesting things we did with him like the model rocket club this is a place where i was not bullied the other big thing was horses you might want to look at a paper that's open access how horses help the teenager with autism make friends and learn how to work. Riding horses and preparing horses for shows was one place where I was not bullied. This springs up friends through shared interests. And the kids that were interested in horses, interested in model rockets or electronic circuits, the bullies were not interested in those things. So I had some places where I could get away from this. That's really important. The other thing is I learned how to work. Even though I was a horrible student, I got kicked out of ninth grade for throwing a book at a girl. I called, she called me a retard, and I got I chucked a great big social studies book at her, hit her on the head with it, and I went to a special boarding school, and they put me to work running the horse barn. And I cleaned nine stalls every day, put them in and out, fed them. I was very proud of the fact that I did that, but I learned working skills. And one of the big problems I'm seeing today on the fully verbal end of the spectrum uh, Kids are not learning working skills. They're not learning life skills, like shopping. I had little bits of allowance, and I was shopping and learning how to save money when I was seven, eight, nine years old. Uh, that's not happening today. Work skills are not the same as academic skills. Too many parents overprotect when I suggest that when they're like pumping some gas at the gas station, have your kid run in the shop and buy something. And so I've had parents say, I can't let go. And I'm talking about something as innocently as buying a jug of milk at a gas station store where you're right there looking in the window. You see, I see it. I even see which gas station I'd do it at, which pump I'd go to, where I could see into the shop. And it's in a really good neighborhood, too. You know, I, I see it. You see, it's specific. So there's nothing abstract about it. And you know what I also love? I mean, by the way, I also love horseback riding. That is just so outstanding. And horses are just beautiful. It's just, but on the other hand, it's also not very accessible. It's also very, very expensive. But what you just said is one of the biggest problems we face today is people are so cut up with their screens. And I see myself. Oh, we got to get them off the, we got to get them off the screens. And that's why I've got these books like um, Calling All Minds, My Childhood Projects, Making Kites. I have another book called The Outdoor Scientist. Let's just get kids observing animals, looking at stars, looking at different plants, get them outside. We've got to get them off the, the screens. Now, I'm not suggesting banning it. Let's do what we did in the 50s. I was allowed one hour of television a day, two hours of television on the weekend. We can do that same thing with video games. You limit it. You don't ban it. You limit it. I 100% agree, but the problem is, too, that the parents themselves are addicted to it, you know? And well, then... we, had, 
you see, we had, a th see, I've talked to a lot, and I'm very sorry to interrupt. This is part of my problem with processor speed. I can't time, and I know it's rude, and I can't help it. But the other I thing love I that. I actually love that because you know why? You are super authentic, you know? You are real. I love that, and it doesn't bother me at all, you know? That is why you are such a such an impactful person because you are truly who you are meant to be, you know? That's why you impact lives because you're authentic to the core, your integrity. Everything you do is because it comes from a place from your heart, I would say, and or no, from your brain or whatever. I'm seeing granddads, grandmothers come up to me to find out they're autistic. They're on the fully verbal end of the spectrum when the kids get diagnosed. Now, why does that grandfather get a good job? Because he had a paper out at age 11. Now, I know those are gone now. I know that. So now we have to find paper route substitutes. Walking a neighbor's dog. It's very important that they do a task on a schedule for a boss that's outside the home. Church volunteer jobs. Just a few months ago, I talked to a 12-year-old. She was the church coffee lady. Autistic. Very proud of that. Okay, these are very simple. These don't cost anything to do. I'm trying to always pick out good low-income options. And uh, doing coffee in a church is something you can implement. doesn't cost anything. And it can be just done in the neighborhood. And the young lady learned some work skills. It is really, I mean, that's who we are meant to be, right? We were always hunter-gatherers, right? And when we move our bodies, you know, there's just a different chemicals in our brain. We change it and that's why it is so important you know that we have this and as you said you know working doing something is just meaningful it connects us to people it connects us to the world right and especially with animals you know it's also so calming we know the important impact it has you know well, i've talked to a lot of people that have had you know like bad childhoods or whatever and the thing that saved them was to have a place a person that was a safe person if I, I, it might be a shop teacher, it might be clergy, it might be um, uh, the next door neighbor, but you know some safe havens where they can get away from it. And I did have, um, you know, even though I was bullied when I walked from the, came in the cafeteria or walked across the parking lot, they would call me tape recorder and bones um, because I always would use the same phrases. I didn't know why they were calling me tape recorder, but I do now. Who shaped who? Was it your personality, who you are, who shaped your career, or was it ultimately more your career who shaped who become? How well, did that did people this ask play me, out? Well, how did I get involved with cattle? I I got exposed to them as a teenager. I want to emphasize the importance of exposing students to lots of different things. So then they have a chance to gravitate towards what they might be good at. Uh, Michelangelo was a 12-year-old school dropout, but he was exposed to great art in the churches. He knew how to use stone cutting tools. And then he started making things, and then he was apprenticed into a studio. So it starts out with exposure, then mentoring. So my boarding school had a little 12-cow dairy. I learned to milk cows there. And then when I was 15, went out to my aunt's ranch in Arizona and got introduced to beef cattle. So that is exposure. See, if I hadn't gone out to that ranch, it would not have happened. But then, too, it's still a leap. Then ultimately, it brought you into the cattle industry. And imagine you were a woman in a highly male-dominated area, too. So what... How was this, you know, this transition that you ultimately, you know, made a career out of it? How did this unfold? Well, I started out um, uh, writing for our state farm magazine. And there were some women in ag journalism. And I went to a cattle event and the editor was there. And I walked up to him and I got his card. And then I, my very first article was kind of a synopsis of a master's thesis on cattle handling and squeeze shoots. And I very quickly got a reputation that when I covered the cattle feeders meeting, I summarized speeches real, real accurately. Now, there were some good people in the cattle industry. And where I got all the pushback on being a woman was middle management, foremans. 
foremans, where the big owners, for the most part, were good to me. And the people working just on the front lines were good to me. Um, being a woman was a much bigger barrier than being autistic. Um, but then when I wrote, I designed some big projects in the in, when I was in my 20s, and I wrote about them in national cattle magazines. You see, I wrote about it. Now, in that part of my career, I thought I could make self-managing systems. But I would put the drawings and stuff in national cattle magazines. And, and I recognized what that would do. And also, this is also very important because you mentioned, too, that sometimes if you want to start or figure something out, start really at the very beginning. You go to KFC or McDonald's and you just start working your way up. But there are two. Uh... I'm doing anything with McDonald's in the, in, the, when, in the 70s. When I started, I was all about designing equipment. And then I'd write about it. You know, I have a lot of, I've seen a lot of teachers do a lot of innovative stuff with the schools, but they never write about it. Now look back on now a 50 year career, writing was a very important thing because instead of holding on to my intellectual property, I wrote about it. And then I got plenty of consulting work. And now I've taken my book money and my speaking engagement money. I've put 22 graduate students through school, masters and PhDs. I have two three PhDs as professors now in three different universities that were my students. That's what I do with the book money and the speaking money. That is, that is unbelievable. And um, what you have done, I mean, and um, it is also so interesting that what you said, it's really also, you have to start somewhere, right? And instead of just keeping your thoughts for yourself you just started producing you just started contributing really to the world right and i think this is too if you have a talent somehow just start actually applying it if you're young just start well in the, in the in the hbo movie temple grandin there's a scene in there where i go up and i get the editor's card that's a very important scene i actually did it the temple grandin movie also shows how i think visually that's accurate and the projects are accurate but a lot of people don't have the guts to go up and get the card and then and then produce a good article. I'm, there, there's, I called it the back door. And I very, very early on, they saw the back doors and I used them. How do you respond to people who say the cattle industry is actually one of our problems that we face these days, especially in terms of um, the contribution to, uh, you know, climate change, let's say. How do you respond? Well, I just, uh, this is my brand new nature that just came in the mail the other day. I read it for breakfast. There's an article in there about methane production from rice paddies and that the more productive they are, the more methane they put out. Well, there's a place for grazing. And I've got this paper right here. It's an open access paper. Grazing on cattle, sheep, and goats is an important part of a sustainable agricultural future. Now, in eastern Colorado, for example, and I live right at the front range in the middle of Colorado, but you drive out east on I-70 out past the airport, uh, you've got land out there that can only be grazed. The only way you can raise food on 20% of the land is a grazing animal of some sort. I don't care if it's bison, cattle, sheep, goats, and uh, what do you do with that land? I was just out there this summer. Somebody tried to plant corn on it, and it didn't even come up to my waist at harvest time. That's not the place to plant corn. So there's a place for grazing animals. So in this article, I reviewed, and this is showing up backwards here, um, I reviewed a whole lot of studies on regenerative grazing, where um, you uh, kind of uh, bunch the cattle in, make them mow the grass, then they move on. And if you do this right, you can actually improve the land because a lot of this land evolved with grazing. The other thing is using grazing animals on cover crops interspersed with other crops like corn and soy. You can improve the soil and uh, reduce the end runoff. Now, if you start doing these things, it takes two to four years to start to see the benefits. But grazing done right, even though they do put out methane and there may be ways to reduce that, um, well, we got to put it in perspective. Um, brand new article in Nature here. Maybe I can find it in here now. Just read it this morning. 
I also had found some of the other stuff on rice patties. But the thing is, what do you do with 20% of the land? What do you do with eastern Colorado? Not raise food on it? And you see a lot of people are doing all this theoretical stuff. I have physically been in every rural area of North America, winter and summer, traveling, extensive travel. Went to the outback of Australia. You've got a, almost as big as the whole United States. You've got an area where there's only one way to raise food on that, a grazing animal of some sort. And they may be part of the solution to the problem. Now, I, I, the way I look at it, you don't get rid of cattle and you don't get rid of rice either. We are doing research right here. My colleagues are doing research here on the Ag Next products. They're working on ways to reduce methane in cattle. And uh, they, it might even be breeding. It might work. You know, this, they're working on it. Um, I, the, re, the results right now are so preliminary, I don't even want to try to tell them. Papers are not published yet. But they're finding some cattle put out a lot less methane than others. How does it make you feel sometimes when there are always these extreme views that are, you know, completely out of balance, you know, that people say, well, it's a problem if you do this and that. How does it make you feel sometimes? Do you get sometimes frustrated or don't? Well, you... I, the way I look at it is there's certain issues. I call it the potato's too hot, you drop it. And there's certain issues I'm not even going to discuss because the potato's too hot. Because if I get pulled into that blast furnace, then I can't work on stuff I'm interested in. What I'm interested in right now, sustainable ag, I'm extremely interested in. I'm also extremely interested in helping autistic kids and these other neurodiverse kids that are different to do really productive stuff, to get into good careers. And so other stuff that's a big, gigantic hot potato, I just don't touch it. You know, what also what one thing I, I sometimes think is, for example, farmers, it's such a beautiful profession, you know, to care about animals and, and just to, because you are part of literally nurturing people, you know, lives. It's so essential. And so, but on the other hand, it's also usually they do not get compensated in my view. I see that, for example, in Switzerland, a farmer, a dairy farmer can barely make a living. That is huge. That's a huge problem, you know? Well, and that, that, to me, doesn't really make sense. You know, how can we make sure that farmers get compensated? Because there's nothing more important, but also it is so demanding. A farmer, I know one of, a one farmer, of the things, you see, I have no abstract thinking. And one of the problems now when you're a verbal thinker, and I discuss that in my visual thinking book, is top-down, big concepts. Well, you don't even know where to start. When I started out, it was cattle handling, something relatively targeted. And when in the beginning, I thought I could fix it all with equipment, and then I learned that this you can only fix half of it with equipment, and then you got to teach people how to handle cattle, right? Um, there's been a lot of people doing that, and but what I've done is I've written about it. It's easy how-to directions, but I worked on cattle handling. Okay, if you want to work on farmers getting compensated, be a lot more specific. You're going to be a lot more effective. And you see, visual thinking is not abstract. Now, what's happening right now, I just was in uh, Virginia, right outside of D.C. Get off a plane at the uh, airport in D.C., uh, drive uh, two hours out in the countryside, and one of the big problems right now is that young people that are interested in farming, um, the land's too expensive. They can't get into it. And that's a problem because I've seen some really motivated young people wanting to do regenerative agriculture and other really good things. And, and that's a big problem. Um, okay, but again, that's something specific. You see, you're gonna do a lot more good if you picked out something specific. How can we get young people that want to start out in farming and, and agriculture onto the land? It's not abstract. And I'm thinking back to a specific trip that I just did a month ago. It's amazing. You land at an airport in D.C., two hours later you're in the countryside. And this is also part of your success because 
that is what goal setting and everything does is right specific you know small things start somewhere but it starts and and and, and you start you know making the ball rolling and then you can actually start changing things that you think are important so it's well, so important especially for young people you know little guys innovate I don't care what industry it is. Take ChatGPT, for example. Little guys innovate. A single graduate student figured out how to take two graphics card computer uh, game circuit boards that they bought on Amazon for a few hundred dollars to figure out how to do the first neural net for artificial intelligence. Probably the most important package Amazon ever shipped. One little guy encouraged by his professor's paper has 120,000 citations. And then the company um, that did ChatGPT was bought out by Microsoft. But little guys innovate. It doesn't matter what industry it is. That's something I've found out from all the years. What is it specifically that you were able since the 80s to bring about fundamental changes in the cattle and livestock industry. I wrote about, writing was a very important part of my career. There's a lot of other people doing some great stuff with cattle, but nothing's written up. Nothing's written up. I was just with a really great teacher yesterday out in Elko, Nevada, doing great stuff. Um, you're going to have to write about it. Just practical how-to articles. And I wrote a lot of those on cattle handling. And nobody else was. You see, in the beginning, I was a pioneer in that. There's other people now doing cattle handling. But they're not that good at writing. You see, my first job was livestock editor for the Arizona Farm Ranchman magazine. That was important. Getting that card. That scene in that movie is absolutely real. But it's also fascinating because a lot of academics, they do the writing, but they do not do the how-to. They just do why or abstract, right? And that's the well, difference the from you. And trying to cross that gap. And I've got some papers online. And I'm right now, I'm paying a lot of money to get papers open access. Some of my old stuff is buying a paywall. I've put it up on my, some of it up on my web page. Um, it might be an old HTML, but it's there. Um, but the writing was really important. And crossing the divide between the practical world and academia. That's a difficult divide to cross. Because then they say, well, you're writing it too, you know, not formal enough. Yep, that's an issue. But I would write in the academic press, you see, and that work's been preserved. All the things I wrote for Beef Magazine in the 70s, it didn't make it to online because everything was pre-internet. But I wrote a lot of articles just for what's called industry trade magazines. You see, I wrote both in the academic and in industry trade. But it's also amazing, and uh, now we are at actually at your book, about your book, Visual Thinking, an outstanding book that I recommend to everyone to read. So I, I, I couldn't put it down. It's so enlightening. But also, you know, you are a visual thinker, so you're an object visual thinker, right? And That's so right. you are still able to actually write, because this is more... What, Verbal thinking, right? Writing is more verbal thinking. So how yeah, are we able did, to bridge that? Well, I the uh, words narrate the pictures. So what we did when we did the visual thinking book, Betsy Lerner was a super good co-author. Uh, she's a total verbal thinker. So I do rough drafts of a chapter, and she'd smooth them all out. So that's working together with complementary skills. That's, that's something that's really important. But another problem I'm worried about now is us visual thinkers can't do algebra. I don't think I could graduate from high school today. I had to major in psychology because I had to dodge the math classes. But the thing is, the, the engineers need us. Because what I found working in the meat, meat industry, I don't care which company I worked for, you had the clever engineers in the shop that were patenting and vending equipment. And then the mathematical engineers would do boilers and refrigeration because we don't understand that stuff. Um, but you have to have both. And the clever engineers are retiring out. The shops were shut down 20 years ago. But you know what's happening now? One of the major meat companies just bought two machine shops. But how are they going to get them populated with new mechanics 
where those kids are playing video games in the basement when they should be inventing equipment. There's a, rule, a link here. I've just watched the whole Boeing mess. Look at this big mess here. Look at this article here. Boeing manufacturing mess. And the door came off because someone didn't tighten the bolts on it. Well, they laid off a ton of people during uh, COVID. And then 20 years ago, they, they sold the, that fuselage factory used to belong to Boeing. They sold it to private equity. And then I found out about loose rudder bolts. I don't know how you can steer the plane if the rudder fell off. It's worse than that door. But it parallels what went on with the meat industry. Um, in the short term, that made money. In the long term, it's a disaster. And I, I also wrote about the Boeing Max mess with the angle of attack sensor. I sat next to a Boeing engineer on a plane after the book was published and found out that the shop guys warned the engineers about the angle of attack sensor and they were just fluffed off. Shop so let's warned. dive a little bit into the details. Like give us like the difference between a, a object visual thinker and a spatial uh, yes, I can explain and, it. Uh, verbal thinker. Let's let's, right, let's get let's this discuss. together first, and then we go more into specific. Because, did, as you said, you save lives. This is, it is so critical. You know, we have critical infrastructure to well, I've had, I've and had, so on, right? But let's I've go had to the book. Come up and they said, "Well, I read your book ten years ago. My kid went to college, got a great job. Thank you so much. You helped my kids so much. I've had parents come up and tell me that." Um, the object visualizer, everything is a picture. Everything is a picture. And abstract math is not understandable. Now, your visual spatial, this is your mathematical mind. Music and math go together. Now, with the object visualizer, art and mechanics go together. And why animals? Animals don't think in words. They're sensory-based thinkers. And, and then a lot of people are mixtures. But the mathematical mind thinks in patterns, patterns, not pictures. And the research, and I have a whole chapter in the book on research, shows that the two object visualizer and the visual spatial mathematics are very different kinds of thought. Then you have verbal. Some people that think almost entirely in words. But then there are a lot of people that are mixtures of the different kinds of minds. But you get a kid with a label, like autism, for example. You might get an extreme object visualizer, but you can also get an autistic extreme mathematician who figured out how to make video game graphic chipboards that they bought from Amazon be the basis of artificial intelligence. When I read that, I'm going, wow. He was in his childhood bedroom in his power in his parents' house running up the power bill. Yeah, and of course what he did in 2012 is obsolete now. But it was a different way. Of, he was an expert programmer. His professor encouraged him. And unfortunately, he's disappeared. I can't find him. He had some jobs at Google and some other companies. And one guy, two video game boards. Little guys innovate. They often don't get the credit they should be getting. But that would have been an extreme mathematics thinker. And then the word thinker, word thinkers that are real pure word thinkers, totally, totally overgeneralize. Like teachers will say to me, well, how do I teach autistic kids? Well, am I talking to a three-year-old here? I can give you a pretty, you know, cookbook answer for that. But when they get older, if it's a bullying problem, they can't do math. Uh, do they uh, get overwhelmed with all the yak, 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 long strings of verbal information? What is the problem? I have to have more information. And the first thing I need to know is age. And once they get past very early childhood, are they talking? What can they do? One of the problems you get with autism is you're going from Einstein at one end of the spectrum to somebody that might have very severe epilepsy on top of it and can't dress themselves. All got the same label. That can be a problem. But some of those nonverbals can learn to type independently and communicate with typing. But you got to use a tablet. Let me tell you why.
because on a desktop or a laptop, I got to look down here. Is the keyboard down here? Print appears up here. Can't make the attention shift. Tablet. Yeah, there's all kinds of fancy things, but you can use a plain old tablet. And let me tell you, I don't care how low income the community is, you can find old tablets, maybe half broken. And if word or text messaging works, that's all you need. But you also mentioned very important, actually, in the book that a lot of schools, actually, they screen out these object visualizers and the spatial object visualizer, actually. And it's well, not first, very good. But the first thing I tell a lot of business leaders is you have to realize different thinking exists. There are some of these educators that don't know that visual thinking exists. And when I was doing book signings for visual thinking a year ago, one of them was done at a school. And I spent an hour talking to the principal of this school about visual thinking. He didn't know what it was. See, and a lot of people are pushing the algebra because they think you need it for logical thinking. Well, what I'm suggesting is let's have some math alternatives, business math, accounting, statistics, or geometry. I'm not suggesting totally getting out of math. But a lot of the people that I work with, in fact, one that's got a corporate jet now, one high school welding class, and 30 years later, can't do algebra either. He, he's building beef plants. But when it comes to some other equipment, like state-of-the-art chip-making machine, poultry plant, pork plant, you're going to have to buy that equipment from Europe. And there's a reason for that. And it goes back to their education. In ninth grade, you can go tech route or university route. We stick our nose up too much at the tech route. But I worked with those people. They weren't just manufacturing equipment. They were inventing it. And they have a bunch of patents, too, and I've looked them up. Yeah, this is so important. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's the same like with the plumber, right? We all need these people. It's crucial. You know, imagine if we will not have like running toilets, you know, that's still a lot of people no, are yeah. deprived. Now of. you'd have typhoid if you didn't control the surge. How can I, for example, improve my object visual thinking? How can people improve? Well, I think on the extreme ends, it's mostly innate. And then there's a lot of people where the first thing is you have to be aware of it. That's the first thing. You just got to be aware of it. And the thing I've found in working, learning about verbal thinkers is just how, over, how much overgeneralization there is. Okay, so politicians come out with some big general abstract theory, but how do you actually do it? Now, the object visualizer sometimes gets too much in the details, and you need some general concepts. But there's so much abstraction where I'm going to give you three simple things to do to help the autistic kid in the classroom. And in food safety, we call those critical control points. As I watched our industry go from the 80s, beef industry was a real mess in the 80s. I thought it was the pork industry. And, I, and there was a big food poisoning. And I watched the industry change. And what they had to figure out on food safety, and I love this concept, hazard analysis, critical control points. What are the really important things to do? Okay, let's say I got to measure uh, germ counts on meat. I can't do a, th a hundred measurements on a, on a processing floor. I just can't. So I got to find out where are the places where you're most likely to get contaminated. That's the critical control point. So then after going to so many meetings, I'm finding this pilot's checklist is really important. Having a, a written checklist of sequence on sort of an external working memory. Bullying is a big problem. LED lights that flicker are a big problem. And the super crazy rapid multitasking jobs need to be avoided, like a McDonald's takeout window. That needs to be avoided. You see, and I kind of bottom up thinking puts things like on a spreadsheet in my mind jobs that were lost because they didn't have a pilot's checklist on the tasks to do. Those are critical control points. What are the most important specific things to do? No, I, when I learned about the critical control points in food safety, I just, oh, there's so many things you can apply that to. 
what are where is the meat most likely to get contaminated? You measure in those places. We will come to this a little bit later because there is so many things that you also talk about AI and also how important it is for critical infrastructure. But now let's just go quickly on a little bit more general social media. How do you use social media? And do you think social media is to a good extent also part of the problem when it comes to people of not having really specific well, things that I they learned about do? social media and I don't, um, I don't post on social media. And the page I do have, they're professionally managed and pretty much is used to advertise books and conferences. One of the problems you've got with social media is emotional quick responses get done. And the other problem is a social media page, because I've looked up how the algorithms work, makes more money the more hits it gets on a link, more hits the ads get. And if you set the algorithm for maximum money earnings for the company that runs a social media page, you're going to get maximum garbage. These people like to read garbage. And and if you cut back on some of the tall and some of the stuff's too hot potato to discuss, with some of the absolute garbage that appears on social media, the social media company will make less money. That's one of your problems. And it's quick emotional responses. And when Facebook first came out, I gave a talk at the Kansas cattle feeders meet, meeting, and I said it's gonna it's gonna exaggerate the uh, viewpoints of radicals on both sides of any issue. And, and that's where precisely what we are now. You you just predicted pr perfectly. I mean, I, I it hadn't been out. It only been out a few months, and I go, it's gonna exaggerate the responses of the radicals. And then the people that have more moderate views get bashed on both sides. So they go, well, I'm not walking into that blast furnace. Give us the best three tools in order to accommodate and best serve object visualizer and object spatial visualizer in schools. Well, if uh, object visualizers, so when they get to high school, I'd cut the algebra requirement and maybe they could take business math, statistics, geometry or accounting. I'm not saying they totally get out of math. And also I would put all the hands-on classes back in the schools. And some schools are starting to do this because I've worked with people that had multiple patents and they had one shop class or they'd grown up working on cars. That was the background. Now for the mathematical kids, what you need to be doing with them is move them ahead in math. This was done with Katherine Johnson, the famous mathematician who who calculated the uh, first orbital flight and all the suborbital flights for the NASA. She was moved ahead in math. Yes, she was horribly discriminated against, but her math education was done right. She was moved ahead quickly. You don't make little math heads do boring, stupid little baby math over and over again. Move them ahead. And some of this algebra and some of this math real verbal, no. Drag the old books out of the attic that have just math. That's what those kids eat up. Now, as an object visualizer, my mother always, always in, uh, uh, encouraged my art and to do lots of different art and not just draw the same horse heads over and over again. To broaden it. I used to make all kinds of things as a kid, little kites and parachutes, tinker for hours and hours and hours. Did the adults help me on that? No. I must have made five different ways of making this bird kite before I got one that flew right really well. And these are precisely these things, too, that actually are extremely good for our mental health because the mental health crisis is also real, you know? You got to get kids out doing real things. I had a girl in my class about just over a year ago. In my class, they do have to do a scale drawing, who had never measured anything, either with a ruler or a tape measure, had never measured anything. Totally removed from the world of the practical. Okay, you're going to be making policy about stuff tomorrow? So if you're going to be making policy about something, you need to get your butt out in the field. You may have to fly somewhere and get out in the field. You're going to have to make it less abstract because, of course, the verbal thinkers are attracted to politics. 
It's so important. I call I call it dragging the suits out of the office. Because when I started the original McDonald's audits, I took high level executives from McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's on their first trips out in the field. It was like that show Undercover Boss. I'll never forget the day when the McDonald's executive watched a skinny, half dead dairy cow walk up the ramp right into their product and go, Yeah, there's some stuff we got to do some things about. But that's so necessary right? because then you can start putting things into context, what it actually that's means. Right. But that's what you got to do. It all turns into an abstraction, hung up in bureaucracy and things like that. I mean, in the 50s, I'm, I'm 76 years old. So in the 50s, government got stuff done. We went to the moon, 60s. We built the interstate highway system. We actually did stuff. And this is also very important because you also mentioned in the book, there are many things that actually keep you awake at night, you know, serious things. So please elaborate a little bit more on that when it comes to critical infrastructure, AI, internet, oh, and why electromechanical time. devices are still so essential. Yeah, you, you have, the way I look at it is the AI system will be hacked. The database will get contaminated. AI is only as good as its database. And if the AI systems allowed to, you know, that runs the power plants allowed to go search around the gutter somewhere, it's going to do something. So I'm going to assume it's going to be hacked and I got to protect. Very expensive. Also, some equipment's dangerous, like oil refineries and things like that, from either wrecking itself or doing something dangerous. And there's one way to do it that it cannot be hacked. Okay, let's say a big turbine spins too fast. Old-fashioned RPM meter, electromechanical, shut her down. Something gets too much pressure. Old-fashioned pressure gauge, electromechanical switch, shut her down. Big water pumps can be ruined by running dry. Put a flow meter on it. Hacker proof. It's not electronic. It's electromechanical. Goes, uh, uh, goes for more than five seconds without water in it, shut it down. Uh, okay, in certain chemical plants, two things mixed together to go boom. I make sure those valves, are, I'm going to put controls on them that are hacker proof. I'm, I've got to protect that equipment from being damaged. Because you take some of this big equipment, I can't, it's not on the shelf. I can't buy it right away. You want to have power? There's some big equipment. And there's some stuff I know about the power grid I'm not going to discuss because I don't want to put ideas in people's heads. But there's big equipment. Okay, I talked about these water pumps. Big equipment, each one of these systems, very expensive. And if a bunch of it got damaged, I couldn't get the piece of equipment. I mean, I'm watching things like missiles shot at container ships. Yeah, that's going to be a supply chain management issue. Yeah, go around the Horn of Africa, doubles the cost of a shipping container. Yeah, I follow that kind of stuff. That big piece of equipment I might need might be on that container ship. Absolutely. You see, there's a relationship here, and I see it. Nothing's abstract. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I read. Well, the Boeing mess is kind of similar to the mistake the beef industry made and the pork industry made shutting down their machine shops 20 years ago. They're paying, now they've bought, just bought two machine shops. I hope they'll be able to repopulate them with some youngsters that will keep them going. But you see, these things are related. Short-term profit. It's very cold here right now. If our power plant goes off, this water system's in this condo, is going to freeze solid. Yeah, and I've been watching the temperature, and I've been... Yeah, I've got all the doors open, you know, where the, what little heat I have. Door in the, where the washing machine nook is, that's open. And it gets really cold. I'm, you know, you know, said it was going to get down to 17 below zero. I've been watching the weather, weather report. Because I know what the water would do, and it flood out two other apartments, and my apartment controls the water for two other apartments. I don't want something to happen. This is the kind of stuff I get concerned about. So important. And you beautifully elaborate these problems really in this book. That's why I highly recommend the book, uh, 
and to also get just a sense how important it is like that we are we are relate to one another we depend on each other and we complement perfectly each other well and the skills complement each other and and i uh, that ought to see i've worked with shop guys um, i remember a guy he could fix anything electrical in a plant anything electrical genius i'm pretty sure he was on the spectrum another thing that's a danger area for a lot of people on the spectrum is changing bosses that can get really dangerous that's where jobs are lost i almost lost my job at the farmer ranchman when the magazine got sold and we got a new boss and he thought i was really weird but susie the nice lady who was probably also autistic that did all the advertising layouts back when you pasted things on paper things i said well jim doesn't like you we're gonna have to get together a big scrapbook of all your articles and show them to jim so I learned to sell my work and I showed Jim my articles and he gave me a raise. Sell the work, sell the work. I'd show off my drawings. I've got some of my drawings right here that are in, in my book. Um, this was in my thinking of pictures book right here. And I've been asked, why is the visual thinking book not have pictures? Because the publisher said they were too expensive. That's the reason why. How does it make you feel looking back at your outstanding career? Well, I want to help other kids to have an outstanding career. And I've talked to granddads that are grandmoms that are on the spectrum. They've had, you know, some good careers. I'm, you know, there's been a lot of talk about identity and stuff like that. I'm basically career is my identity. I am what I do. And right now, I want to encourage the encourage the young ones and uh, and do uh, do talks at universities, students on animal behavior, talks to teachers about autism. And what happens with some of these parents is they get so hung up on the autism label, they don't think the kid can do anything, and they overprotect them. And I'm appalled that the number of fully verbal teenagers labeled autistic that have never gone shopping by themselves. This is ridiculous. And that's why we have you. We have such an outstanding person who, whether uh, when it comes to autism, to animal handling, animal sciences, behaviorism in, in general, uh, outstanding. What are you most proud of? Well, on animal welfare, I've designed a lot of equipment. I'm very proud of that. And in the 80s and early 90s, a lot of my equipment was out in the industry. And unfortunately, quite about half my clients tore stuff up and wrecked it. So the thing that made the biggest difference was getting McDonald's, Burger King, and Wendy's, all three of those in a single year, all in, and I trained them, enforcing the same simple measurement system. And I saw more change in 1999 than I saw my whole entire career when big companies inspect stuff, but very simple. Now, the other thing I did since I was an equipment manufacturer and designer is I did reverse conflict of interest. I bent over backwards to not shove any expensive equipment down their throat. We took some shabby old dumps and we made them work with simple changes like non slip flooring, changing the lighting. Cattle don't like to go into the dark, training the people, moving smaller bunches of animals. Very, very simple things. And out of 74 plants, only three out of 74 had to buy expensive equipment. And I'm very proud of that. And I used all my design ability to make the simple changes. And I have the same approach with autism. I talk to families where there's no services. Well, then you need to enlist the grandmothers in the neighborhood through your church group to start working with this three-year-old. And here are some books and videos that could be helpful. I've got to start working on them now. The worst thing you can do is just let them zone out on phones that's the thing not to do. What's your dream come true? Well, I just want to help train the next generation. You see, my much more basic and applied. And the thing that I did back in 1999 with McDonald's, Wendy's, and Burger King, back in the 70s, that would have been 
beyond my wildest dreams. They bought, McDonald's bought from just about every big meatpacking plant. There were a couple of exceptions. What was interesting about the McDonald's supplier list then was who was not on it. It was a plant that had a history of food safety problems. They were not, never on the list. Uh, but uh, when big corporations can really make change. Also, I wasn't asking of the plant to go out there. And, it was very clear what they had to achieve. They had to make certain numbers. If you couldn't make 95% of those cattle unconscious on a single shot, you'd get booted off the list. So what did you have to do to fix that? Maintain your equipment. Manage your stuff and maintain it. You see, it was very clear exactly what was expected. And I had all three of them enforcing the same thing. I think it's not an exaggeration to say your life, what you're living is truly you are living your dream. It is the perfect dream. Well, and I want to help, but the thing I'm learning is the world's getting more verbal now. And I'm amazed at just how much overgeneralization there is. And also the things I worked on were targeted things. Okay, back in 1999, it was improving animal welfare at beef and pork slaughter plants. Again, that is something that's targeted. It's not saying, well, today people say, well, the whole world's terrible and unjust. That's too vague. Work on something specific and you'll be a lot more effective. And that's how you become truly a game changer and a change maker for positive, for the betterment of humanity. And I think there's no better one than actually exemplify you and to bring you to the young generation and precisely what you're doing. Oh, so you're truly I'm, a gift. That's what I'm trying to do. Also, I emphasize the practical. What are practical things that a mom can do? Okay, she's got a kid that's not talking. All right, no services, certain parts of the country, there's no services. And what can that mom do? There's no, well, if you have a three-year-old who's not talking, the worst thing you can do is nothing. So what can we do? Well, there's some books you can buy, some videos you can look at, and you go to your church and you ask the grandmothers in the community to help work with this kid. All right, getting the first job. A lot of times that can be done in the community. Somebody has a local store and the kid, you put the kid to work there. A lot of people are, they, they don't, you see, I visualize sort of examples of stores, even right here in Fort Collins, places that would be wonderful, like our Barnes and Noble bookstore would be wonderful. I'll tell you one thing that's terrible at Barnes and Noble, Christmas wrapping station at Barnes and Noble was chaos. And I would not put them on that. Other, and I would not start them at Barnes and Noble at Christmas time. Otherwise, that bookstore would be a perfect place for a verbal autistic person to think. So let's talk about jobs for the different kinds of minds. My kind of mind, skilled trades, art, uh, animals. Now, the thing that worries me about art is AI. Hands-on jobs will not be taken over by AI. All kinds of skilled trade stuff, design work, working with animals. Um, now, the mathematical minds, uh, computers, well, there's going to be some computer programming stuff that's going to get taken over. Video game design, forget it. AI is going to eat that one alive. But the, the skilled trade stuff, it's totally safe from AI. I'm watching that all really carefully. Uh, physics, you know, high level. Now, your high level computer programming at the highest level will guide AI. But let's say the programming to make a web page, that's going to get automated. Now, how about the verbal autistic? There's a verbal autistic. We haven't talked about them. They know every fact about everything. Their favorite thing, whether it be uh, uh, baseball statistics, whatever, movie stars, whatever. Now, where they can really shine is what I call quiet specialized retail. This is a special category I've made. Because people have told me about where they've been successful uh, selling complicated financial products. I've been on uh, Zoom calls with banks. And they, they have knowledge of the product, selling phones. Oh, like on a Walmart, and there's like 15 phones. Uh, now they have them tied down so they can't be stolen. But 15 phones there and three different calling plans and different SIM cards. And ah, where do you start? 
Well, that's where an autistic person can help pick out the right phone, not shove the most expensive one down their throat. The right phone plan. Uh, sporting goods has been very successful. Another place for the verbal autistics, selling new cars. There's been four or five real successes with that. You see, but all of these retail environments, you're working with one customer at a time to pick out the right thing, and they're appreciated for their knowledge of the products. Uh, selling specialized business insurance. These are all actual cases. You would then I'll go, now what do these cases have in common? It's specialized knowledge, one customer at a time, and even in the Walmart, it's, you know, you're just working with the one customer at a time to help pick out the right phone and the right phone plan. So that's where the verbal autistic thinker, the fact thinker. Oh, another one, auto parts store. He memorized every part number in the warehouse. They love him. Okay, those are things that are specific examples. But then I can see that there's a common denominator. I've been in our auto parts stores and they're pretty quiet. They're not chaotic environments. Most of the time, the Barnes & Noble bookstore would be perfect. But let's stay away from another Christmas wrapping station. That was chaos. You see, and I see it. I remember standing next to the Christmas wrapping station. I'm going, this is where I don't put them. We'll start a job at Barnes & Noble after Christmas. You see, I just see it. I remember thinking that when I was there. You see, and I look at that and I'm going, that's where I don't put them chaos and you're going to wrap the wrong book and give it to the wrong person and they're going to be mad not christmas presents open then it's the wrong book i can just visualize that you're going to have a very unhappy customer what makes you feel alive well when i have people come to me at the airport and said well you know my kids got a job and loving it and i you help get me to do it that makes me happy or somebody come to me, I had a person come to me at the airport uh, yesterday and said, came up to me and I uh, said, well, you know, I have a friend that has one of your corral systems. We built it 20 years ago. We're still using it. We love it. You know, look, look at it. Let's look at it. the things you do make a positive change. I'm also extremely logical in how I think. Professor Campbell Grandin, thank you so much for being on the show and to be truly a gift to me and to the world, truly. Well, thank you so much for having me. Professor Campbell Grandin, that's why knowledge matters. Make you life a masterpiece. Visit now programs.d-ykm.com